Morning, everyone. As you can see, I'm Tim Evans, Geographic <coughs> ABS, based at the University of York. Um, going to very quickly introduce what we mean by grey literature for those unfamiliar, perhaps unfamiliar with that phrase, and then present some of uh, case studies of archaeological publication and the role it plays in publication and the potential of grey literature in an open access approach. It is based on a mix of my own PhD research and my uh, ongoing work at the Archaeology Data Service, notably the Oasis Project, which hopefully most of you are aware of, and the Roman Rural Settlements of Britain Project. Uh, just to note, examples I'm going to talk about are all based from England. Um, that's not to exclude uh, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, but legislation and practice in those countries differ slightly, so my focus today is very much on England. Um, England, as parallels across anywhere with the history of rescue or development-led work, has seen an unparalleled rise in excavations since the days of classical laid-out research excavations, through to literally working in front of bulldozers, through to uh, PPG-16 in 1990, and the embedding of uh, archaeological excavation or mitigation as part of the planning process. You want to build a housing estate, you want to build a road, you want to build a Tesco car park. It goes through the planning process. Some kind of archaeological response normally occurs. And indeed, just looking at statistics, what we may call intrusive investigation, watching briefs, evaluations, excavations. Most recent figures, he says, peaking in 2007, um, would say we have an average of about 4,000 intrusive events in England every year. Of course, going back, this has led to a publication crisis over the years. I'm sure all of you are familiar with these, both in England, the UK, and further abroad, is that not everything gets published in a way that people think it should be published. Lots of epistemological crises, we don't know what's going on, etc. And this has also been reflected in the types of outputs that are being produced, um, moving away from our traditional uh, regional or county-based journals, the bedrock of what has traditionally been considered our publication outputs, site-based monographs, and introducing over here, rather unglamorously, what is sometimes referred to as grey literature. And so those reports produced by a unit or contracting organisation that goes to the client and the local authority and reports on what has been found. Uh, this has caused some trauma in English archaeology. Uh, most notably, I think most people will be familiar with the paper and work done by Richard Bradley and Tim Phillips from the University of Reading in the first decade of the 21st century, where Richard Bradley turned around and said, my teaching is out of date. I'm not getting access to all these great literature reports. I'm 20, 30 years out of date. How do I know what's going on in my field of late prehistory? This is a serious problem. Uh, Rumsfeldian unknown unknowns there. It's like, how do we know exactly what's going on? Just to note, Richard Bradley's research has actually been archived with the ADS <laughs> at that DOI uh, there. Thumbs up to him there. So again, all this is going into grey literature, it's a problem. It's a problem because traditionally it has been relatively inaccessible. These forms of uh, output have been paper-based, and located either at the unit or at the relative uh, lo um, the, uh, appropriate local authority. So for example, if I wanted to go down to Truro to look at grey literature from Cornwall, it would take me 10 hours to drive or a 300 pound train trip. So not always appropriate or easy for me to get to. There has also been an opinion or perception of grey literature in archeology span as being poor quality. Um, that's quality in terms of academic content. Uh, there's no interpretation, there's no thought, it's just archaeology by rote, churning out tables that mean nothing in reports of context, but also poor quality in terms of basic content. I think Rich Bradley highlighted in some cases the lack of a simple plan to understand where it was and the nature of the archaeological resource excavated. It's worth just pausing on this slightly 
And actually, stepping back to consider what grey literature actually means, um, archaeology, at least in the UK sphere, actually stole the term grey literature from the information science and library community back in about 1995-1996, as far as my uh, research goes to show. And outside of archaeology, grey literature is actually viewed as a very positive thing. Uh, there's a group here, Grey, Grey Net, Grey Literature Network Service, which again is information science and librarian professionals, that actually think Grey Literature is a very good thing. Uh, their, part of their definition of Grey Literature here is based on, yes, it can be of very good quality, it's worth collecting, it's worth looking at, and it has an advantage because it is not controlled by commercial publishers. So in essence, it is open access. So these were some of the questions buzzing around my mind uh, when it came to my PhD research. So I looked at how much grey literature is there relative to traditional published material, and indeed wholly unpublished works. Why does it exist in the first place, and is it all bad? Um, when it came to actually data gathering, I focused on two counties in England, Staffordshire in the West Midlands, uh, which is often a very urbanised area. Uh, North Yorkshire, a very busy area, archaeologically speaking, predominantly rural. Um, I went back to the original uh, events records of the historical library records, national monument records, various databases, various tools through libraries, speaking to people, and to actually compile, and this was for most of the 20th century and the first years of the 21st century, to compile a index of every intrusive event, every output, assess what was found and the quality of the uh, written output took me about three to four years part time in my evenings and weekends actually going to these places and trying to create a definitive list of what had happened and what had been written for these two counties, which is a saga in itself, which I'll have to say from another conference. I don't think it's ever been done in the UK before, and it probably won't be done again since it took me so long, which is another issue. But effectively, that's what I did. Looked at what had been produced from these excavations, and actually, was it suitable? How accessible was it? The quality of it? And I could go really graph heavy here. There's a lot of graphs and a lot of number crunching came out of this research. Julian's read the thing twice now and probably dreading more of these graphs. But just to summarise uh, very briefly, when you actually look at the majority of the 20th century, you can see what I call the successful publication of projects from the two counties was hovering just over half in Staffordshire and well under half in North Yorkshire. As you can see, and bizarrely I've colour coded grey literature orange, it you know, doesn't make sense that I should have actually done it now. You can see we have substantial amounts of what I called part published grey literature in each county. It is interesting to note, however, the relative levels of stuff that has absolutely no output whatsoever, even in terms of an interim report at the ACR or the relative organisation. And just to focus on those events that were dictated by the planning process, so commonly after 1990, we can begin to look at, so with one of the development-led work, thousand events occurring every year, what happens to them? Well, again, you can see, for all my intrusive events, you're talking less than half is published. If we dip, in, dip that to filter to just excavations of regional or national significance, so things that should be being picked up by academics and research frameworks, it drops even lower. In North Yorkshire, uh, scary so. Why? In the first instance, a lot of these events, such as evaluations, have no recourse to further publication. They are meant to dictate uh, the appropriate planning response. And if they do find something of significance, the response may just be preservation in situ. So there's no time, there's no money to produce a journal article. Interestingly, smaller excavations that could still be of regional importance are often deemed to be adequately served by grey report only. We'll come back to that later. There's also personal and organisational issues. Mistakes are made, 
disaster happens, people die, get sick, places close, these things happen. Local curators can have difficulties in enforcing post excavation recommendations. So it's of no want of effort on part of those curators and those counties I've talked about. It's just that when they're not backed up by their non archaeological uh, colleagues in local authority, there's just simply nothing they can do. And that is often tied to a lack of money involved in the development. If the overheads are small and it's not part of a large, big infrastructure project, it can simply get brushed under the carpet. That's a whole other conference in itself. I, mean, I think it's a parallel session about it going on at the moment. But also, a lot of these things aren't accepted by local journals. Uh, local journals like to keep an eclectic mix to keep their clientele interested, and they just don't want to fill it with rote archaeological publications of another Iron Age farmstead. So that's the negative side. However, to flip it on its head slightly, is it all a bad thing? Uh, these are very core statistics for Staffordshire and North Yorkshire. And these are all the works undertaken by, uh, through the planning process. And as you can see, OK, we don't have a very successful publication rate, but at least we're getting something out of it. If you compare it to research, mm -hmm. those done by academics, but also local societies or random people, you can actually see the successful publication rate is actually not that much better. And indeed, there's more black holes coming out of people that really perhaps should know better. So at least we're getting some form of written output. Um, in terms of quality, this is just a breakdown of what we've got in Grey Literature reports from the County of Staffordshire. As time goes on, uh, the level of, if you can call it peer review, is getting better, but the actual content of these reports is more varied so by the end of my period here, every report looked at at least has plans, section, photographs, decent fines reports, often by people based at universities, subcontracted out, and the location of the archive. So it's not all bad. Things are getting better. People are getting better at producing great literature. Which at that point, I stood back and said, well, going on what I'd learned from those two counties, is it even possible to publish everything in that traditional journal or monograph uh, format? No. With the best will in the world, as things stand, it's just not possible. So, in the first instance, should we refine what it is to be published, perhaps? Perhaps look at innovative methods of publication, wider synthesis, and as part of that, an increased and pragmatic emphasis on grey literature, including perhaps ditching that term with its negative connotations which is where open access comes in. Um, this is the ADS library, soon to be redeveloped in autumn of this year, uh, which currently has almost 40,000 credits reports from England, Scotland and Wales <coughs> within. Most of these reports derive from the OASIS system. For those of you not familiar with OASIS, it's an online form for the recording of your events and the uploading of your so-called grey literature to the form and then it is released into the ADS library where it's publicly accessible. It's, we started releasing reports from Oasis into the library in 2008. This is just England, my stats. We're currently at 25,000 reports from England and it's growing at an average of three to 5,000 reports every year. It varies year on year, but it's working, people are using it. And I think this is uh, what we spoke of the very first, People are using it, and this is what I wanted to focus on lastly. This is a current research project the ADS are working on, the Roman Royal Settlement of uh, Britain project, um, led by Mike Forford at the University of Reading, but with Cotswold Archaeology, with the majority of its funding coming from the Labour Human Trust. They've kind of picked up the baton from Richard Bradley and are looking at all the outputs from uh, excavations relating to Roman Roman Settlement in England and Wales, and putting it all together into a beautiful synthesis. The data is currently on, there is a DOI there. <laughs> Please do look at it when the slides are uploaded or you can find it on the ADS website. First phase is live, second phase of data will be live in December of this year. Um, so a very quick turnaround, which is another good uh, advent of uh, open access data. 
from this project, they found three and a half thousand records from England pertinent to their research. You should know going back to the 1800s. They found 1,600 records with grey literature sources, and of these, 1,300 records were only documented by grey literature, so had no traditional published output whatsoever. And this represented just under 1,500 reports. Now, of these 1,500 reports, this number here were online and open access by the ADS, 22%, which I think is actually a good thing. Hear me out here. Here is a breakdown of the date of the grey literature reports used by Mike Fulford's project. As you can see, they actually go back pre-1990. And this is the date of the reports used and found by the project released by Oasis. As you can see, the closer we get to the present day, the closer the red line matches the black line. In essence, the academics are finding these reports online, free to access, not having to travel down to Truro and pay £300 for train, uh, and feeding into a pretty fantastic academic synthesis project. In short, the system's beginning to work. There is a virtuous circle in place. And this is something I thought when I was listening to you talk about earlier was these type of meta-analyses, I think, are the things we should be shouting more of. So when people say, why am I using the form to upload this report? What is the point of it? I don't like uploading a form. You can actually point to a project like this and say, it actually does have a benefit. It's feeding into a wider synthesis, our knowledge of the landscape, which itself feeds back to the curatorial body and those working out in the field. It works. There are issues. Adobe Plus has to be a slight negative. This is the coverage of Oasis in terms of records. It certainly has a heartland. It was piloted in East Anglia back in the early 2000s. And this was reflected in the types of output uh, picked up by Mike's project, as in everything produced in Suffolk or Norfolk was going online and it was being found. Areas outside that core zone, less was going online. Um, I think that is something that the ABS and partners are addressing. Uh, Oasis is currently being uh, rebuilt and remodelled as part of the Herald project, of which there's a URL to the blog there where my colleagues are rebuilding the system. I talk uh, a reporting on why people aren't using Oasis and how to get people working in those areas there using Oasis and making it work for them so that hopefully in 10 or 20 years' time, when another big research project rolls along, the whole map will be purple. Final thoughts, um, just to finish on a pragmatic approach. Um, Relationship can be a good thing, it has to be a good thing. Just to recap that, based on my uh, extensive research, we can't publish everything in a journal. So we're going to have to rely on grey literature for certain classes of works, and indeed focus on making grey literature better in terms of quality. <coughs> and finally, it is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, these are just PDF reports online, he says, just are. Um, what about the data behind the reports? Um, how much more useful would it to have the original site plan in a vector format rather than just a flat image in a PDF file? So we're going to be going back out to these people that are already using the Oasis system and saying, you've done great work so far, this is working. Let's look at getting the rest of the archive online as well for truly open access data. Thank you very much for listening.